This program is brought to you by the partners of A Root Awakening International. Help others find truth. Support A Root Awakening International today. The history of modern Israel is a complicated, messy situation for which the world proposes an oversimplified two-state solution, which will never work. Keith Johnson reviews some modern history and explains why Israel's borders are so tense today, because it's the end of the sixth day, the sun is set, and this is Shabbat Night Live. There you are, what took you so long? Shabbat Shalom Torah fans. Welcome to Shabbat Night Live with Michael Rood. There is no two-state solution for Israel, only an impossible problem. Why is that? Well, Keith Johnson explains tonight in episode three of Bible Beyond Borders. We're also going to share another special presentation from Michael Rood detailing every aspect of the Ark of the Covenant. This is a good one. This is a fascinating teaching and it's only six minutes long. So uh, something else from Michael Rood, it was the astronomically and agriculturally corrected biblical Hebrew calendar. There you see it there. We are on the second Shabbat of the seventh month. Now, please welcome my co-host, the one and only Tiffany Panaccio. Shabbat Shalom, Scott. You probably are the one and only Tiffany Panaccio. Probably. probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You look up Scott Laird and there's like a million Scott Lairds all over the internet, but oh no, <laughs> Tiffany Panaccio, that's a, that's a unique, unique one. Unique, yeah, there. Yes. Now, speaking of unique, the Ark of the Covenant, what we have here at the ministry is, for, as far as I know, yep. the world's only one-to-one -one size replica of the Ark of the Covenant that, um, that Ron Wyatt yep. saw. Uh, beneath Golgotha. I think maybe Kevin Fisher has one as well that he okay. made. But this is, we made this one special and we took it to, uh, I think it was a Passover event first time. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've shown this thing to people as well. Yes, when you come to the Rude Studios um, or for an alive event that we're having here, that's one of the highlights. We get to see the Temple Treasures exhibit and uh, that is, of course, a highlight of that. So yeah, and that's, awesome uh, that's the person. Temple Treasures exhibit is basically what? It's like replicas of all the stuff that was in the mm -hmm. tabernacle, right? Yeah, so all we the have things. Awesome things. And the Ark of the Covenant is so special because when people have come through, um, we leave them, give them some you know quiet time in that area, and people will write down prayers and lay them on the Ark of the Covenant. And then our team, the ministry team, would go and pray over. All the prayers. Yeah, they're the prayers. Yeah, not, not that we're saying this is a special thing or anything we've no. built. It's just a replica of, yep. of a replica of what's in heaven, right? But exactly. it's it's just a nice thing for people to sit there and imagine what what the uh, the real one looked like and mm -hmm. what the you know the ultimate one looks like in heaven. Yeah. So it's a nice place. It is a very nice place. <laughs> okay, and by the way, last chance to get the love gift uh, after Shabbat. You are welcome to go to rudestore.com and you will find this there under the love gift. All right, so Keith Johnson reviews some modern history and explains why Israel's borders are so tense today. And Michael Rood gives us a glimpse into the Ark of the Covenant. Here it is. Moses was told to build the tabernacle and its holy furnishings according to the pattern he was shown on the mountain. He built these articles not as an exact replica of their heavenly reality, but according to a pattern, a symbolic likeness that represented what Moses saw when he was taken by revelation vision into the throne of the Most High. The golden menorah represents the seven flaming spirits of God burning between the throne of the Almighty and the sea of fire and glass. Yohanan, John also witnessed this heavenly spectacle. He recorded his experience in the book of the Revelation. The golden table of showbread represents Yehovah's provision for his people, their daily bread, always before his face. All one must do is ask, give us this day our daily bread. He is willing and able to provide for our needs. The golden altar of incense represents the prayers and worship of God's people that envelop the throne room. That heavenly aroma 
is forbidden to pleasure any mortal man. The altar of incense is positioned outside the Holy of Holies, but in the holy place, directly in front of the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is an ark, an acacia wood box, covered inside and out with pure gold. It is ornamented with alternating bells and pomegranates below the golden crown. Two staves are passed through four gold rings along the bottom, by which the ark is carried on the shoulders of four priests. Inside the ark is the covenant, the Ten Commandments written in stone by the finger of God, twice. On the broken tablets, which are hewn out by the Almighty, and the second set of tablets hewn out by Moses. That second set of tablets represents the promise of a renewed covenant. The same commandments written on the tablets of the heart we willingly present to him. On the back side of the ark is a gold pocket. Integral to the structure, it secures the original scroll of the covenant Moses wrote when he came down from the mountain with a continuation of the commandments that Israel was too afraid to hear directly from the Almighty. This is the very scroll upon which Moses shook blood-soaked hyssop branches and announced, this is the blood covenant, as he sprinkled the altar, the people, and the scroll. The people all understood the deadly ramifications of the blood covenant. They had entered into a covenant with Yehovah. The blood of slain bulls sealed their agreement with the Almighty. Whoever breaks the covenant is as dead as the bulls that shed their blood. If Israel breaks the covenant, they die. If Yehovah breaks the covenant, he dies. That is the reason we are commanded to seal our solemn oaths with, as Yehovah lives. Covering the golden ark is the seat of mercy. Mercy is unmerited favor and withheld deserved judgment. The mercy seat is literally the kapur, the covering, the seat that covers the broken stone tablets of the covenant. It covers the pot of manna, the daily bread we remonstrated against in the wilderness, and it covers Aaron Rod of priestly authority against which we vehemently rebelled. The mercy seat is positioned directly in front of the handwritten scroll of the blood covenant, the covenant Israel had broken even before Moses returned from the mountain with the first tablets of stone. The Ark of the Covenant was built according to the pattern Moses was shown when he was taken to the throne room in heaven. It is a typification of God's throne in heaven, not an exact copy. In reality, four terrifying, eternally living beasts surround the throne of God, each with six wings, covered with piercing eyes that see everything and know everything at a glance. They cry, holy, but the mercy seat over the ark is flanked by two winged masculine verone, cherubim who look down in silent reverence, gazing at the blood of the lamb on the mercy seat, sprinkled by the high priest. Two of their wings join to form the back of the throne, a representation of the throne of God in heaven, but this throne is reserved for the future king the son of David, who will rule the earth from that throne in Jerusalem. My name's Keith Johnson. I am here in Israel. Not far from me off to the left is Lebanon, not too far away is Syria. But you know what? I actually am so excited to be at this particular place. 1300 BC is this gate back here, which they call Abraham's gate, which means it's possible that Abraham himself could have walked through this gate. But this is amazing. You've got to come to Israel. It's, I mean, it is revelation, it's inspiration, it's, it's explanation, and more than that, it is excitement. 
to come. So join us, bfainternational.com. Come to Israel up close and personal. No one seems to know how Yehovah's time clock works, even in the promised land. While the Gentile world remains oblivious and rabbinical Judaism insists on doing things their own way, one daring duo decided to do it right. I'm here because in just a little while, we're gonna to attempt to do something that the world is waiting to find out, and that is to actually cite the beginning of the seventh month, one of the most important periods of time in biblical understanding. Keith Johnson and Dr. Nehemia Gordon crisscross the Holy Land to bring you Right on Time from Israel, an adventure that will inspire you to treasure the fall feasts of the Lord like never before. You won't find this exciting teaching anywhere online, but we'll give it to you as our thanks for supporting A Rude Awakening International. When you donate $50 to this ministry in September, we'll send you Right on Time from Israel with Keith Johnson and Dr. Nehemia Gordon on DVD or Blu-ray. Donate $100 and we'll send you Right on Time from Israel, plus a beautiful laser-cut wooden art piece featuring the Second Temple. Donate $300 and we'll send you Right on Time from Israel, the laser-cut wooden art piece, and an authentic natural curve ram's horn shofar, plus a matching display stand. These gifts are a limited time offer from Michael Rude to thank you for your support. Make your donation today and receive the $50 gift, the $100 gift, or the $300 gift. Thank you. Your donations ensure that important teachings like Right on Time from Israel keep coming from a Rude Awakening International. Use your cell phone to scan the QR code on your screen to donate now and receive these limited time gifts. Or call 888-766-3610 or get your gifts online with a donation at monthlylovegift.com. If you like what you see on Shabbat Night Live, you'll love the bonus episodes. Now available only on the michaelrood.tv app. These bonus episodes dive deep to give you more serious study, cutting edge content, and righteous raves you won't find anywhere else. It's Michael Rood Uncut. Sign up now to get the michaelrood.tv app free for 14 days. It's everything Michael Rood plus all new bonus episodes you won't find anywhere else. Sign up to watch now at michaelrood.tv. The night of the Last Supper, Yeshua took our tone, our tone, leavened bread, and he blessed the Most High, and he broke the bread and said, this represents my body, which will be broken for you. He took the cup, and he blessed the Most High, and said, this represents the renewed covenant in my blood. The following day, the following day, on the 14th of the month of the Aviv, there were two large loaves on the wall of the temple. And when they took the first loaf down, after that, no more bread, no more leavened bread was eaten. Then when they took the second loaf down, that's when all of the leavened bread in the city of Jerusalem and everywhere else was completely expunged. It was burnt in the fire. That was the rehearsal that was done the following day, just before the Passover lambs were sacrificed in preparation for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But Yeshua represents in this very thing, 
in the breaking of the bread that we do in the Kiddush, in the sanctification, every Shabbat, we remember that his body was broken for us. By his stripes, we were healed. And in the taking of this cup, as we say this prayer in thanksgiving to Almighty God, Baruch Atah Yehovah Eloheinu Melech HaAlam, Borei Pri Hagafen. Yeshua said, this is the renewed covenant in my blood. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Every meal, any time, any Sabbath, any feast, any time that you need to remember his broken body and shed blood, we do this in remembrance of him. So we all know the story. At first, the Israelites crossed the Red Sea, and that's a miracle in and of itself. And after that, he says, when you come into the land, okay, well, there's another crossing, a crossing of the Jordan before that can happen. You come into the land. God say anything about borders at that point? Well, this belongs to that person, that belongs to that person, so don't go up there. <laughs> and it may be illegal for you to go, no, 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 no. He said, I will bring you into the land and drive out your enemies little by little so that the beasts of the field don't take you over. I'm gonna do it strategically. But that's all he said. So now, what's with these borders we have today? Well, it's a complicated subject, and we have someone here who can explain all that. Keith Johnson, welcome back to Shabbat Night Live. I wish I could say I could explain it. I'm gonna to attempt to put it on the table and let you fix it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. That's what I love about you, Scott. You can fix this, okay? Yeah, okay. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about, and I've been waiting, I have to tell you, uh, you know, the first episode was just, uh, for me to see what these young folks did, uh, Hunter and his group, and our uh, car, our executive, all these people working together to do that and then to show it. Really, I gotta just say, it excites me that we did that and we're kind of plodding along. But I will tell you, this episode is one that I've been waiting to talk about and you're gonna be the first person I get to really talk about it with. Oh, cool. So okay. really what we're dealing with in modern day Israel is a, a bit of a political problem. If you guys talk about the two-state solution, the two-state solution, the two-state solution, and I, actually I call it a two-state problem. It's, it's not a solution, and, it's, and, and I, I hate to say it, um, the solution that they're coming up with will never be a solution if what I believe is true, which is the father determines who is on his land and how it works, and I know that's tough, big pill for people to swallow, but he gathers and he scatters, amen? Yep. So um, I wanna just give a little bit of important history, though. Uh, we have what's called the, the Palestinian Authority. They have been put in position to represent the Palestinian people. So in 1964 or so, uh, it was the creation of the Palestine Liberation Organization, which was a combination of different smaller groups that were sworn enemies of the newly formed uh, land of Israel. As we know, in 1948, five Arab armies came against Israel. They weren't supposed to win. Israel was able to survive that situation. Borders were set up. We know about that. 1967, something happens. It's the Six Day War. This is that they say that this war is like one of the most amazing military accomplishments ever. In six days, uh, Israel was able to um, to 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 what I'd say uh, to conquer the land. Uh, and they had people that were preparing. Egypt had moved tanks into the Sinai. Uh, there was a bunch of things that were going on. As we know, I don't know if you knew this or not, what, the, the West Bank is actually called the West Bank because Jordan annexed that section in 1948 and made it the West Bank. Even they, after a while, said, look, we're out of here. And they mm. moved away and the name stayed there. But again, we call it Judea and Samaria. So, Six Day War. Israel defeats the armies of Egypt, Syria, and Jordan and took military control of the Sinai, the Golan Heights, the West Bank, and East Jerusalem. So now all of a sudden you have a unified Jerusalem that Israel is military control over. So many Israelis, when this happened, and I think Aaron would, would agree with this and he'd probably say the same, many Israelis saw this as an invitation to settle to be able to go to Judea and Samaria. So think about this, 1948, 1947, they say, look, here's the mandate, two-state solution. The Jewish people say, okay. The Arabs say, no way. Here's your section. They, up until 1967, they were in their 
area. And Palestinians, we call it Palestinians, the Arab people that were there had said, okay, first we're under Jordanian occupation. Funny, they didn't talk about occupation so much when Jordan, but anyway, <laughs> a Jordanian occupation. And then they have this section. Okay, they're there. The, the PLO says, look, we represent the Palestinian people. 1967, this happens as a result. Um, as I said, many Israelis felt like in 1967, it was a miracle. What do you mean? We can, ne there's no unified Jerusalem. If you go to Jerusalem right now, you know, there's East and West Jerusalem. Well, if you're from an Israeli standpoint, there's Israelis in East and West Jerusalem. They see it as a united, a unified city of Jerusalem. It's their capital, if I can say that. Um, now, that's controversial. Um, many people, obviously, politically, they say that it's illegal for them to have any say over what's going on there. And there's more we're gonna talk about when we get to the next episode, when we talk about the Temple Mount that is under the you know, religious authority of the Jordanian um, uh, waqf. But many Israelis, as I said, move into these places because they're saying, look, we won. We, I mean, you know, they went right. to, <laughs> went to the what, we can, we can go to the Temple Mount? We won. We can go to the Golan Heights. We, we can go to Sinai. We can go to East Jerusalem. Well, this is amazing. This is a biblical, this is amazing. This is an amazing thing that happens. But Israel has a problem, and a real big problem. And the big problem is all of a sudden they are over the territory where you have people in 1967 who are already living there. And so the question is, if we're a democracy, mm -hmm. are we going to give one man one vote to two million people that are in the area of Judea and Samaria or the West Bank? Or are we going to basically say we have military oversight here, but then still kind of give them the mm -hmm. ability to, uh, to have whatever you want to call it, self- Self-governance? Gov yeah, whatever. So something happens in 1993. Now, this is the part that I want to kind of plod through. It's important for people to know this. In 1993, there's what's called the Oslo Accords. There's two steps to the Oslo Accords. In step one, they were signed, 1993. So you've got, um, you've got uh, the Prime Minister of Israel, you've got Arafat, who's the, who's the leader of the PLO, and you've got President Clinton, who brings them together. And this was a huge deal because they, they were working behind the scenes and no one knew it. Um, the reason they called the Oslo Accords is because they secretly began negotiations in Oslo, Norway, without actually having negotiations between Israel and the PLO because it was illegal for anyone from Israel to negotiate with the PLO because the PLO was seen as a terrorist organization. That's the bottom line. But in, in there, there, this working was going on behind the scenes. Different people started talking about different things and different opportunities, and the negotiation process started. Here's what happens. As a result of step one, Scott, Israel accepts the PLO as representatives of the Palestinians. This is a big step. They're saying, and listen, if you know anything about history in the PLO, uh, they got some, <laughs> I mean, there's some, there's some blood on their hands, right? The Munich, Olymp I mean, there's, there's a bunch of stuff yep. that, that happened there. And, and listen, let's just be honest. When you're talking about starting new countries and you're talking about, about borders and boundaries and people and religious challenges, there's a lot of stuff on both sides where if you looked at it, you'd say, did that really happen? But of course, see, when I read my Bible, I find some pretty heavy stuff in my Bible regarding God saying, go into the land and here's the deal. We're not gonna have negotiations. There's not gonna be a political solution. There's not gonna be a two-state solution. In fact, it says, at, at, at one point, Yehovah says, listen, there's a, there's a clock that's going on in about 400 years. This clock is ticking and I'm gonna take my people and bring them back. But as soon as the clock ticks at 12, then the land is ready for the people. You mentioned it earlier. So Israel accepts PLO as representatives of the Palestinians. The PLO officially renounces terrorism. This is important. They, the Israel said, look, there, there's no agreement unless you're officially gonna say, we're not gonna use terrorism. Third thing was a real big one. The PLO recognizes Israel as a country. Now, when you talk about that, that's also a big issue because we don't want to acknowledge the fact that they're officially the state of Israel. You know, if we just don't acknowledge it, then maybe we can keep living in this fantasy. And the other thing was the Palestinian Authority was created to govern parts of the West Bank 
and Gaza. The West Bank is what they would, they would call it. We'd say Judea and Samaria. Now, if you're the people of Israel who believes that Judea and Samaria is the biblical heartland of Israel, imagine this. You're excited. 1967 comes, hey, look, we didn't ask for this. It happened, but now we've conquered the land. We want to go into Bethel. We want to go into Jericho. We want to go into, we want to go into all these biblical spots. And I mean, when you're there, town after town, whether it's the name of an Arab town that still has the biblical name, it's amazing. It, mm. it, it, I mean, I'm telling you, we were with Aaron and he was in Ophrah and he was walking along with us. And again, he'd point. And he'd say, you see over there? And he'd mention some biblical thing that happened. And you see over there? And it was like, it was like just amazing. Okay, you're like, you're right in the middle of it. Well, the Palestinian Authority is created to govern these parts of the West Bank. Now, in 1995, something else happens, part two. And this is where this gets really, why we're talking about Bible Beyond the Borders. Um, Israeli forces... It was negotiated for Israeli forces because remember in 1967, the Israel has got military control over all of this area, okay? It's like Joshua in, okay? Mm -hmm. They got military control. They withdraw from the largest Arab populated cities, including the biblical cities of Jericho, Bethlehem, and 80% of Hebron and East Jerusalem. So this means that literally, they'll think, just think about the ir irony here. What was the first city that God told Joshua to conquer? Jericho. They crossed the Jordan. The first city is Jericho. In 1995, it is decided that Israel's military will withdraw and this will be now uh, under what's called the Palestinian Authority. There are three areas. We talked about it in the video from episode one. Area A is exclusive PA control. There's a red sign. And I will try to put a, get the picture of that red sign for people to read it. It's really quite um, amazing when you read this red sign and you're crossing into these places where at the bottom it says it is illegal for Israelis to go past the red sign. Mm. Area B, the Palestinian Authority, has civilian control, but Israel, Israel still has military control. Now, go back to Mount Deval. Why could we have the military take us to a place that's under Palestinian authority? It's in the West Bank, but it's Judea and Samaria because the Israeli military in Area B has military control, okay? So, Aaron says, Keith, yes, we can go, but we have to work with the military to do that. And let me just say this, for those that get nervous, think that if, if you go on tour with Keith, he's gonna have military. No, 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 that was a, that was a, that was a very specific situation. Um, many of the places that we go, we don't need that, but we, you know, we always are under the Israeli security. Area C is what they call presently the settlements. The areas where there are Israelis who live in biblical towns, biblical hills and tells and, and whatever that is exclusively under Israeli control, meaning Israel has got both civilian control and military control. Now, when this happens, uh, there's an uproar. I mean, this was, this, this was actually negotiated with uh, Yitzhak Rabin and, uh, uh, and Arafat uh, under the watchful eye of the United States and everybody else thinking that we're gonna have peace. What happens in 1995, at, uh, I think it's towards the end, end of 94, 95, uh, and actually a Jewish person um, that they call uh, uh, an extremist, um, obviously, but he ended up assassinating a Rabin because there were many, many people who felt like what they were negotiating was completely opposite of their faith. Why they believed that they were in the land of Israel you just gave away these lands. Now think about this, Scott. If you're an Israeli, it's 1990, let's say it's 1980. You go visit Jericho, you go to Bethlehem, you go to all these places. And in 1995, the Israeli authority, it, it says this, if you cross this border, it's illegal. It is, it is dangerous to your life. Mm. Aaron actually talked about that. So, 
2000 comes along, now it's time for the Camp David peace talks. This, this isn't working so good, 1993, 1995, still no peace, still no peace. President Clinton attempted to mediate a two-state solution again. <laughs> Here we go. Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak and Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat. Three offers were given. One, it was over about a two-week period of they were in these negotiations at Camp David. And he starts out and he says, okay, listen, I'm gonna give you 100% of the Gaza Strip. Now, for those who don't know, the Gaza Strip is right the borders to Egypt. And it's been a part of, you know, it was part, Israel had it and it went back and forth, back and forth. Uh, long story short, Israel, it disengages from Gaza. So what does he say? And uh, he says, listen, I'm gonna give you 100% of Gaza and 80% of the West Bank uh, and a divided Jerusalem. This was the first offer. Arafat says no. He comes back again. All right, I'm gonna give you 100% of Gaza, 85% of the West Bank and a divided Jerusalem. Arafat says no. He comes back at the end of the negotiations. I'm gonna give you 100% of Gaza, 91% of the West Bank, and divided Jerusalem. Israel says, okay. Arafat says, no way. Here's what Clinton said. He said he told Arafat that by turning down the best peace deal he was ever going to get, the one offered by Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak and brokered by Clinton, the Palestinian leader was only guaranteeing the election of the hawkish, he called him, Ariel Sharon. Now this is interesting. But Arafat didn't listen. Sharon was elected in a landslide on February 6th and Arafat was exiled, never to return to Palestine. Mm. Now we're getting closer to our time, okay? Because this is about to be the whole thing that I'm gonna tell you about how when I first met Michael. 2000, Ariel Sharon is the prime minister. He does a radical, radical thing by most people's eyes, but for him, he's like, I'm just doing what we do. What did he do in 2000? He decided to go and visit <laughs> the Temple Mount. Mm -hmm. I remember this. Now, there had already been an intifada, an uprising that had taken place. They called it the first intifada. This started the second intifada. He went up there with, you know, surrounded by people. And when, when they saw that, they started spinning it, saying, he's gone up there. They're going to take over the Al-Aqsa Mosque. It's an attack on the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And he said, listen, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to go visit this place where God said his name is forever. I'm going to go do what I do. 2002. Now, in the middle of this intifada, and, and listen, my friend Michael will tell you stories. I'm gonna tell you a story that Michael will confirm. 2002, I get this invitation to go to Israel. I don't know who to go with. I don't know where to go. I'm not gonna get on some bus. I'm, I'm supposed to be there. I find out about a guy named Michael. I call up told a thousand times. Michael invites me, I'm there. While I'm there, Michael is out on the street. I happen to be somewhere else. And it was one of the suicide bombers. Michael's out on the street, not far, boom, suicide bomber. This would happen every other day. Now, I'm not exaggerating. Boom, people would have these, these things happen. And Michael's there, like literally, and we get back to the apartment, he says, hey guys, and he tells the story. He says, hey, I, I, I was there. A head is at his feet. People were being slaughtered on a regular basis in the second intifada. And at that time, God calls me to Israel. While I'm in Israel, I'm learning a flood of information. But the biggest thing that happened to me was that I realized that in that situation, there is no solution. Mm. There really is no solution. So 2005, they do the disengagement plan, Gaza in four settlements in Northern Samaria, they remove Jews who were living in these places forcibly. Mm. They remove them. 2006, Hamas wins the election over Fatah, which is a PLO. The rest is history on the lack of any solution to the conflict between Israel and the people who are presently called Palestinians. It isn't gonna happen. If you've got a place called Hamas, an organization called Hamas, in Hebrew, Hamas means violence. Mm. Hamas is in Gaza. I think the most recent situation, a thousand rockets in two days. What do you do? There's no two-state solution. 
The landlord is going to decide who's gathered and who's scattered. Now, we're going to move on to the next part, which is these two biblical cities. But I got to tell you, to understand kind of what's happening politically helps you know why it's so tense regarding the borders. And we, you know, we say the Bible, the Bible can get us beyond the borders, and that's what we decided to do. Mm. Fabulous. So we have a couple of videos in the next half, too, Absolutely. Right? Okay. Absolutely. So From the biblical cities. From the, of Jericho and Bethlehem. Two places we should be able to go to. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, that's okay. right. All right, so we're going to go there next. Hope you are with us. Thank you for making it possible. Your donations make this possible. That's how this works. And donations now help other people to see this into the future. Thank you in advance for doing it. We'll be right back. Thanks for your support of Shabbat Night Live. So let's say you're from New York State. All of a sudden, oh, you, yeah, you can go anywhere in New York State, but you can't go to New York City, and you can't go to Syracuse. <laughs> well, my, my family's been here for generations. What do you mean I can't go to Syracuse? What do you mean I can't go to the city? That's the situation for people in Israel. Their, their ancestors conquered these places, in, in the, you know, and, and now they can't go. Not, not only that, only conquered, they were given by the landlord. Mm. The landlord yep. gave them. Amen. Yep. And you know what's really interesting about this? We're going to take this. I want to do this right away. I, like, I love this. They, they, they create a nice graphic for us. Uh, to the border. <laughs> Let's go to the border. And I want to show you this, folks. This is, uh, this is Jericho here, um, right there in the middle. And then you got Bethlehem just below it. So you got Jericho and Bethlehem. Um, these are places that if you are an Israeli citizen, and I'm actually going to, um, I'm actually going to show you something. Uh, when I was on my way to Jericho with our group, I had this really um, strong, strong, strong unction to do something. Now, I'm gonna share this in just a little bit, but usually when we go to Jericho, what we do is we'll go to Jericho, and if we have an Israeli guide, the guide has to let me be the guide. I have to be the person that leads us across the border because it's illegal for an Israeli citizen to go to Jericho. And it says on the red sign, this is dangerous to your life. They're very, very clear because what they've said as regarding to these Oslo peace accords, uh, whatever you wanna call it, peace plan, I don't know how that's working out, um, that uh, we're gonna give you full range of authority over these areas that if Israeli citizens go there, hey, you're on your own. Now, sometimes, 
Uh, there are times where um, the Israeli military has to go into those places. And it is a, it is a, it is a, I don't know if I can say that. I, I guess I can't say that here. It's tough. I mean, when they go into a place that's under Palestinian authority, and why do they have to go into those places? Because oftentimes there's enclaves of terrorists that are in these places. Now, not everybody that there is there believes in the ideology of the Hamas or, or the lion's den or um, any, any number of the, the names of the places of, of groups of people. But sometimes the Israeli authority has to go in there to try to uproot mm. that which is taking on. Now, um, so, so as I'm preparing to go there, usually what we would do is we would go into Jericho and we'd go to a place that's called uh, the, the, the Mountain of Temptation, it's called. And you go into Jericho and you'll look over to the left and you'll see these uh, gondolas and then you'll go up and you'll get to the very top and you'll look across and the churches, you know, the historic church, Helena and the group have put their spot and said, here's where Yeshua, Jesus was tempted. And so people go into Jericho, go up to the top to look at this place. Now I've actually taken the gondola across and, and walked up there and been to the place and knocked on the door, in fact. <laughs> knocked on the door of the monastery, no one answered. <laughs> I wanted to know like, well, what's the basis of this, uh, this, this happening? But this time, because of the Bible Beyond Borders, um, Scott, I just, uh, I had this really, really strong unction. And we're gonna, um, we're gonna show the video of the result of that unction. But I wanna do this first. 13 times Jericho is connected to the Jordan River. 13 times when you see the word Jericho, it's connected to the Jordan River. Why is that? Because the Jordan River is right there. I want you to open your Bible that we're bringing beyond the borders, mm -hmm. and I want you to read Jer uh, uh, Joshua chapter 3, verse 14. Okay. 3, 14. Up to just 14? Through 16. Through 16, okay. Accordingly, when the people struck camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carried the Ark of the Covenant in front of the people. As soon as the bearers of the Ark reached the Jordan and the feet of the priests who carried it touched the waters, the Jordan overflows the whole length of its banks throughout the harvest season, the upper waters stood still and made one heap over a wide space from Adam to the for fortress of Zeraton while those flowing down to the Sea of Araba, that is the Salt Sea, stopped running altogether. The people crossed opposite Jordan. So the people- Jer Jericho, Jericho. So the people crossed opposite Jericho. That is a big hint. This is the Bible GPS. In other words, you got the Jordan River running long. In fact, there's a traditional spot, we say way up in, up in the north in the Galilee, where people used to, where there's a traditional spot where they do baptisms. Then you got this baptism place area now. And I remember, really, really interesting, Nehemia Gordon and I actually, back in, um, oh, I must have been in 2014 or so, we actually went to this spot and tried to get to the spot where this was, and it was closed. Mm. A year later, we came back and it was open. But on the side, it said, uh, their landmines don't cross these areas. And why is this? Because it was a military zone between Jordan and Israel. This is where the, mm. the battle was literally taking place. Well, today, you now can actually take your bus right across from Jericho to the Jordan, and they've set up a spot where people are down there and they're dipping and they're having their baptism, some people mikvah. And, it's, and I gotta just tell you, Scott, it's amazing because I'm, I'm sitting there and like, like I can throw a rock and there's the Jordanian military. Mm. So they're over there with guns. And on this side, Israel's with guns. And in the middle, you've got this water where you've got people, all sorts of different mm. people that are going down into the Jordan River. And all I think about is the fact that this is an area opposite Jericho where God did an amazing thing. Mm. The second time they crossed the water. What did he do? He told them, listen, be strong and courageous. Then he tells them to cross over. They cross over, and what did he do? He split the water, just like he did at the Red Sea. Like, I mean, is this not amazing, right? It's absolutely amazing. So this is actually the spot that that happens. Now, back to my unction that I had. So we're over there, we've dealt with that. Now we're in Jericho, and I'm crossing over, and I'm supposed to go to the traditional spot where we have the temptation of Yeshua slash Jesus. And something says to me, I'm just not gonna do it. I said, I wanna go to the archeological site of the walls. 
mm. of Jericho. And I want to do something that I think would be symbolic. So I used a little of my Arabic. We went to the restaurant. The owner was there. I talked to him. I say hello. He says to me, welcome. I bring up my Bible. He says, why are you here? I said, I want to open my Bible and read it at the spot that it took place. Welcome, my friend, he says. You have free reign. Why did he ever say that? Can we take a look at what happened in Jericho when he gave me free reign? Can you put up that clip? Can I read the book? Yes. Now Jericho was tightly shut because of the, because of the, uh, I'm sorry, tightly shut because of the sons of Israel. No one went out and no one came in. And Jehovah said unto Joshua, see, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and the valiant warriors. And you shall march around the city, all the men of war circling the city once. You shall do so for six days. Also, seven priests shall carry seven trumpets, say trumpets, trumpets. of ram's horns, say ram's horns, ram's horns, before the ark. Then on the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And it shall be that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all of the people shall shout with a great shout. And the wall of the city will fall down flat. And the people will go up every man straight ahead. We are going to reproduce what happened in Jericho. If we only had a ram's horn. Do we have a ram's horn? Oh my goodness, we have one. I'm going to blow it. After I blow it, I want you to shout. You see, you all, my Jewish brothers and sisters can't come because of a wall. Fake authority. I'm going to pray that that wall falls down. I'm going to pray that this land is opened up the way it's supposed to be for Jew and Gentile to go throughout the land to enjoy the Bible beyond the borders. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'll blow the shofar, you shout, and I'll deal with the repercussions with my new friends. <laughs> Amen? Amen? You guys are ready to shout? Yes. Yes. Oh, did I tell you we're in Jericho? <laughs> did I tell you we're at the very spot where this happened? Yeah. Did I tell you that after this, we're going to go to the actual spot where the, where the water split and they all came through? Can I get an amen from you all? Yeah, yeah. I can't Woo! believe it. Listen, you all, do you understand? Look around. This is an archaeological site. They have found old walls in this spot and you all are here. Wow. I got the chills. Woo! I feel it. Do you feel it? Yes, the Bible Beyond Borders has happened and will continue to happen as we have the faith and lack of fear to do what God calls us to do. He called me to bring somebody here. You all said yes. Amen. And now he's opened the doors. I'll blow the shofar and you're going to shout. I'm going to blow the shofar and you're going to shout. And amen. 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 <laughs> That's great. That's Jericho. The place that if you're an Israeli, you can't go. Huh. And something said to me on the bus, now this is controversial, a little bit. <laughs> you're going to go to the place where the Palestinian Authority has authority a place where oftentimes the Israeli military has to go into Jericho. In fact, while we were on the trip twice, there was major violence in Jericho. And I'm driving on my way down this highway and something says to me, you know, it would be really good if we could go to this place and blow the shofar. But I'm like, Keith, you're real, now you're going too far. Yeah. <laughs> you're going too far. I have a Jewish guide. It's illegal for the guide to go to Jericho. My bus driver is Jewish. It's illegal, literally, to go there. And they both said, Keith, we'll go. We went, hmm. and I gotta be honest with you, it was, it was, it was, it was so surreal for me. Because I'm, I'm there and I'm thinking to myself, so why is it that they can't come here? 
If you ask Nehemiah Gordon right now, Nehemiah, since this time, have you been to Jericho? He said, no, I won't. I'm not going to Jericho. Are you kidding me? They'll kill me, he'll say. No, that's, that's, that's actually, he's told me that more than once. And, and for me, as an American, I'm thinking to myself, well, what, what can I do? Okay, it's not illegal for me to go. It may be uh, n- not... Um, ill-advised. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Probably ill-advised to go there and to blow a shofar in Jericho. Um, but I believe we're, we're, the safest place to be is the center of God's will. And, and it, was, it was important for me uh, to do that at that time. That's where I felt like I needed um, to do that. But as I did that, I, I really believe that the Father is opening something up. I really believe, Scott, in my heart that he's doing something. We're, we're, I'm, I am really serious about this since Saudi Arabia. I can't find fear. And then maybe that might sound a little weird, but from coming down the mountain, it's like I just, I felt like I was in the presence of the Almighty. There's no, there's no, there's nothing close to being with reverential fear. So to be afraid of man or to be afraid of politicians or to be afraid of the police or to be afraid of uh, terrorists just is not in my spirit. Now I'm wise. I want to make sure that I'm safe and that's why we do what we do. But uh, in that situation, I felt like it was a, it was an invitation hmm. and the door was flung open. I don't know if you realize this, but basically what would normally happen, you know, if if I was gonna go somewhere like that, they'd like send people to follow us, you know, like the people would follow you around. I'm telling you, we got off the bus. The guy was amazing. He said, you have free reign. I told him exactly what I want. I didn't tell him about the shofar, but I told him exactly what I do. Now I wanna say something else that's kind of interesting. I didn't get to talk about this in episode one, but uh, one of the things that I did uh, when we were in Mount Eval, the reason this whole shofar thing happened is that my friend Matthew said, Keith, listen, I really want to get a shofar in Israel. And, and uh, we looked and looked and looked and they were too expensive. And finally, you know, we found one, we got it. But when I went to Mount Eval, I called Aaron ahead of time. I said, Aaron, do you have a shofar? He said, no, Keith, I don't have a shofar. We get to Mount Eval. And he says, Keith, at the last minute, I found someone in Ophrah who had a shofar. I didn't, it didn't make it into the, to the episode, but I, I will tell you what I did as I went there with our group. And before Aaron presented, I felt such an unction. I took out that shofar and I blew it. And I mean, it was like the beginning of the tour. So this mm. is the second witness of the shofar. Once at Mount Eval, where Joshua brings the people and once in Jericho. I mean, it was, it was absolutely amazing. So that's, that's Jericho. I mean, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. Like, honestly, if you were with me, would you say I'm a nut? I'm like, what would you? Like, what? I'd be looking around my shoulder a little bit. Going, <laughs> Is this okay? But but then again, what are they afraid of? Are the walls going to fall down again? I mean, yeah. yeah. No. Yeah. Well, so. maybe there's another wall. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Maybe there's another border. Yeah. You know, maybe maybe the father is going to do something in our lifetime, or maybe beyond our lifetime. Maybe mm-hmm. the next generation, these young people that I went with, man, they were just. Amazing, amazing, amazing young people. They had no fear. Uh, they're, they're really good, as you can tell, what they do. Producers, c- camera people, uh, ex- they're just wonderful. But like in their minds, they're like, oh, are we have an opportunity to experience the Bible? They had never been to Israel. Well, absolutely. If we're in Jericho, makes sense to us. Yeah. <laughs> well, it might even break, break down some you know, walls uh, yeah, between yeah. the Palestinian folks there too. Yeah. Well, Just to see what kind of joy other people yeah. find in the place where they live. Yeah, and I wanna, and listen, I'm not, I'm not trying to say, you know, that every Israeli should just go and cross. Listen, there's enough people like Aaron and others that are living under constant threat um, where they are. I mean, they're doing everything they can uh, to be in the land, but they're also fully aware that what's around them. And, and it's not, it's not an easy, it's not, that's why I say to people, And I wanna say this to my friends that are listening. It's easy to be in the United States of America and watch the news and make a decision or a determination about what's happening in Israel. Put your boots on the ground and be there, completely different, Hmm. completely different. And you know what? We say that this is our book. We say that this is the most important, and certainly by sales, nothing's been sold more than the book. And there's people who believe this is their book and we have an opportunity to experience what happens in this book, in this land, where the landlord still says to us, I'm calling you, why not? Now, the second place is Bethlehem, Bethlehem, and this is just take a second, 
I want to read Genesis 35, 19. So Rachel, Jacob's wife, died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. Jim, says 48, 7. Now as for me, I came from Padan Aram. Rachel died to my sorrow on the land of Canaan. Uh, to my sorrow on the land of Canaan on the journey when there was still some distance to go. And I buried her there on the way. That is Bethlehem. So in other words, um, so basically what you have is, is that, it, it, you know, Jacob has Rachel and Leah. Rachel died before he could get her to Hebron. Leah is actually at, at Hebron. So um, 1 Samuel, uh, you shall invite Jesse to the sacrifice. I'll show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me one whom I designate to you. So Samuel did what Jehovah said, came to Bethlehem, and we know the story about David. David is also from Bethlehem. Now, real quick, real quick, 31 seconds. There is a really quick uh, video I want you to show. Video number seven. We are in Beit Lechem, which some people call Area A, inside of Area A. This particular side of the wall has got graffiti. It's a big old door here that opens. But I wanted to come here just to show you just how big of a deal this is. Since 2000, it used to be that people could move freely between Bethlehem and Jerusalem. But now because of the wall, that doesn't happen. But that doesn't keep us from coming on the other side of the wall. And that's where we are at Beit Lechem, Bethlehem. Mm. So much more to talk about. We'll try to do it in the last episode, but I mean, so much happens in that place. I got to share some of what happens in Bethlehem. So. All right, good stuff. Well, thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. We have one more to go. Uh, Shiloh and the Temple, the Temple Mount. Mount next episode. Wow, yes. that's going to be a good one. Okay, so join us for that next week. Until then, Shabbat Shalom. We'll see you later. Shalom, Torah fans. Give this video a thumbs up and share it with a friend. Tap the subscription button and the bell icon, and I promise to update weekly with in-depth biblical research. Be sure to download the new michaelrood.tv app for both mobile and home devices for even more commercial-free content.